Okay, it's about two minutes after the hour, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, thank you all so much for being here today. Um, this is the Youth in the Humanities grant workshop um, for Humanities DC. And we're going to be going over this grant opportunity, allowing you an opportunity to learn more about our organization and share your ideas and projects and things like that. So as I said, we'll give you an intro to the organization. We'll talk about the purpose of the Youth in the Humanities grant program. Um, we'll give brief introductions to our team and also ask you for brief introductions if you're willing. And then we'll go into the specifics of the grant application. Um, it, this is be, being recorded, so you will have access to this recording. We'll send it out to all of those who registered and also post it up on our YouTube page. If you'd like, you can also enable captioning. If you click the small ellipses button, then you should be able to enable captions if that's helpful to you. If you have questions throughout, um, please feel free to drop them in the chat. And um, my colleague Hillary will um, help me kind of watch those and, and uh, respond to you as needed, but also jump in. If you have questions, you can raise your hand and we'll be watching those. Um, just don't send them directly to me because I may miss them. And so with that, um, I'll say again, my name is Leah Gage and I am one of the community grants managers here at Humanities DC. Um, I help to oversee all of our grant portfolios, but am the main point of contact for the Youth in the Humanities opportunity. And there's my email and phone number if you need it. And Hillary, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Hello, everyone. My name is Hillary Steen, and I'm the other Community Grants Manager at Humanities DC. I also oversee the grants portfolios, and I will be an additional point of contact for any grant-related questions. Thanks for being here. Hello, can you introduce yourself? Sure. Hello, everyone. I'm Loy Namar, Director of Grant Making and Programs at Humanities DC. Glad that you're interested in this relatively new grant opportunity for us. Thanks for being here. Great. So a little bit about Humanities DC, for those of you who don't know, um, we are one of 56 state humanities councils. Um, obviously, uh, D.C. is not a state, but D.C. has a Humanities Council, as well as the other territories of the United States. We have been in existence for over 40 years, and our goal as an organization is to connect residents to storytellers and creators who are already doing humanities work and to support the work that um, those creators and, and, uh, and experts do. So to do that, we do this in a couple of ways. Um, we do this through public programming that we sponsor ourselves. We, sponsor, uh, we partner with these experts and storytellers to offer programs. We offer fellowships. Um, we have the DC Oral History Collaborative. We have a monthly culture series. Um, there's a podcast that we uh, developed last year called Porch Tales. And we have our community journalism program. Um, and we also offer community grants. And so that's one reason you all are here right now. Um, we just closed cycle one of our grant opportunities and cycle two just opened and includes the Youth in the Humanities grant program as well as capacity building. Um, we fund about $1 million in grants each year and we expect to do that um, in, the, in, the, in this year as well. So um, I'm curious actually to ask you all what, how you would define humanities because this is something that comes up quite a bit. Um, and so we have a little bit of a description here, but is anybody willing to, to jump out and, and kind of explain how you see the humanities um, either by unmuting yourself or by dropping it in the chat? All good. It's kind of a complicated question. And so that's one reason why we want to, to present it here. Feel free to jump out if you have any other thoughts throughout this slide. But for us, we define the humanities as human stories that allow us to navigate the complexities of our past, present, and future. Um, we learn from history and literature, uh, language and comparative religion, and we challenge uh, assumptions with philosophy and ethics. The, the humanities, humanities 
are a compass for interpreting what humans make and exploring what makes us human. Go ahead, Hillary. Yeah, Beth just put a really interesting answer in the chat. Uh, she said, building curiosity around the world and empathy for other humans which is definitely one key element of the humanities. So thanks, Beth. Definitely. I think um, building, huma building empathy with other humans is one of our primary goals um, as using humanities as a tool. And it's also a primary goal of this grant opportunity, which we'll go into in more depth. Um, but definitely building empathy is a huge piece of this. And we do that using the tools and the disciplines of the humanities. Um, humanities disciplines provide a framework for this complex navigation and for asking difficult questions, for raising larger issues to preserve authenticity. That's something for us here at Humanities DC, we're thinking about how are we preserving DC's culture? How are we telling DC residents stories? Um, I see here, Kari wrote, humanities define the core elements of collective societies. That's really interesting. I like that interpretation a lot. Um, right, because these core elements, maybe we're, we're thinking about our connections to one another, the way that we think. Um, basically, I think of the humanities as kind of defining or developing um, frameworks for how we think about culture, our history, our experience as humans. And so I'm also going to include this lengthy definition from the National Endowment for Humanities, because it is um, what we look to um, as the primary definition of the humanities. And one thing I like about this definition is that it lists very clearly the, many of these disciplines. So the study humanities includes, but is not limited to the study and interpretation of language, linguistics, literature, history, jurisprudence, philosophy, archeology, span comparative religion, ethics, history, criticism, and theory of the arts, and social sciences that have humanistic content. Um, and so, yeah, I would say that as we see Bethany here has written, I would say the humanities elevate the distinctive elements of what make us human in the process of making knowledge, meaning and connection with each other. Beautifully said. Um, so wanted to start off with this to kind of um, frame the rest of our discussion because how we define the humanities will in a lot of ways um, define how the eligibility requirements behind this grant opportunity. So the youth in the humanity, oh, sorry, I see one further comment. Culture is unique because it is a product of human creativity and expression while also being classified as technology in the context of evolution. Exactly, yes, very, I like that, talking about culture and rooting it in culture. And that's one of the reasons why, you know, we attempt to preserve culture and, and tell the stories that make up culture, especially here in DC. That's that's one of the things we're about. Um, so this grant opportunity is called Youth in the Humanities. Um, this is our uh, second year of offering this grant opportunity. And this grant offers general operating support to nonprofit organizations who serve youth and young people ages 11 to 24, primarily. We support organizations that use humanities as a tool to help young people explore issues they identify as important. So again, thinking back to that definition of the humanities and the disciplines that we that kind of make up the humanities, we're looking for organizations that use those those disciplines um, to engage with youth and to um, present them as tools for youth to use. So you know, thinking about history, thinking about how we study history and understand history, and then using that as a tool to help understand my place as a young person in DC, in the United States, in the greater community. Um, we encourage this, this opportunity encourages DC youth to utilize applied humanities in their lives and work. So thinking about, you know, understanding literature, perhaps understanding, um, you know, creative thought, um, ethics, things like that, that they can study and understand from a disciplinary perspective and then apply it in their lives. Um, one of the things that's key about this grant is that funding is unrestricted and intended to support an organization's general operations. Um, we do have allowable and unallowable expenses, which we'll talk about later in the presentation, but the goal of this grant is really to serve as general operating support. 
And this is a grant of up to $25,000. The grant period is from July 1st, 2024 through April 30th, 2025. And I see that I've failed to mention, but this grant is due May 1st by 5.59 p.m. So I'm just gonna say that again, this application is due May 1st by 5.59 p.m. Um, and we'll go into the application and what that all looks like so that you can see it. Um, but we aim to turn around decisions fairly quickly, which is why the grant period begins July 1st. Because this is a general operating support grant, there's no project that need is, needs to be defined, but the funds must be spent within that grant period. This grant is open to Washington DC based nonprofit organizations with a proven track record of working in the humanities and those that serve youth between the ages of 11 20 to 24 as their primary audience. Sorry about that. Um, again, we support general operations through this grant. Um, this grant opportunity is not open to individuals or individuals who wish to apply through a fiscal sponsor. Um, organizations must be 501c3 nonprofits and must have a physical DC address. We expect to award five uh, grants in 2024. And last year we awarded about 19% of eligible applications. And really quickly, Leah, I just want to say one thing. Um, you said it previously that we're looking for DC-based nonprofits that serve youth primarily between the ages of 11 and 24. So just want to clarify that it is okay if your organization also works with people of other ages. It's just the purpose of this grant is to encourage young adults, um, youth, to be interested in the humanities. So that's why this particular grant is focused on those ages. But again, if your organization also works with younger people or older people, that is okay, as long as this age group is the primary target audience. Thanks, Hillary. So one of the things about this eligibility, the eligibility requirements is whether or not your organization is a humanities organization. And so to help think this through, because it's not always super apparent, we've asked a few questions here that you might ask of yourself um, as you think about whether you should apply for this grant. Um, does a humanities organization, are we a humanities organization? Well, are we using the humanities? Are we using humanities disciplines primarily as a key piece of our mission to help young people explore and navigate their place? Um, are we hoping to help build connections to answer or ask large questions about DC and uh, its residents? Uh, are, is the work that we're doing asking and answering big questions to help young people understand their world and expand critical thinking skills? Um, again, building empathy, that was something that somebody mentioned. Um, does the work that your organization do help to make connections between youth and between their communities and build empathy across differing um, thought points, differing ideas, differing communities. Does the work you do help young people explore careers in the humanities? This is something that um, this grant could support as well, organizations that encourage youth to seek careers and professional opportunities in the humanities or to apply humanities concepts in their professional and you know school, uh, educational lives. And then, is a, another question is might this work that you're doing help to document young people's contributions to the humanities um, young people making history young people um, working in literature studying language things like that um, thinking about ethics um, these are the sorts of things that um, this project or this grant program might fund and with this grant opportunity it is what we call a non-program grant. So some of you might be um, aware of other grant programs that we have that are more um, program specific, but we're asking as you think about the humanities definition, look at your mission statement and what you do as an organization um, because Youth and the Humanities grantees are organizations in which a major, major piece of what they do as an organization, i.e. what's in your mission, 
is humanities focused. So this would not be for organizations that occasionally do humanities projects. This opportunity would be for organizations in which the humanities is a major piece. So just wanted to clarify that a little bit. Thanks, Hillary. And when we go into the application later, you'll see there's an area where you'll talk about your mission statement and how that applies. Um, but I think it's really key that Hillary called that out, that it really needs to be a key part of your mission as an organization and the primary motivations behind your existence as an organization. So applicant requirements, these are some key requirements um, that you will need to apply. Um, so as I mentioned, this opportunity is only open to nonprofits. You will need to have valid nonprofit status as well as an EIN number. You should be registered in DC with a physical Washington DC address, um, not just a PO box. A UEI number registered with SAM.gov. So this is something that um, can trip people up. So I wanna call it out here. Um, SAM.gov is um, where we, that's a tool that we use, the government provides to check um, whether or not there are any exclusions to your organization from receiving funds. Um, and this number used to be called the DUNS number. Some of you may have that number, D-U-N-S. It has now become the UEI number. Registering for a UEI number doesn't take a ton of work, but it does take, it can take five to 10 business days from what we understand from applicants who've gone through the process. So I wanna call it out here. Um, it should not cost any money and um, there is no fee to do so. And if you start going through the process and it seems like there are fees, please reach out to us immediately. We know that some organizations have um, received incorrect information um, that they may need to kind of work with um, a consultant or a contractor in order to do this, but this should be something that's very easy to do online yourself. Um, another requirement is that you be in good standing with Humanities DC. What that means to us is that you have no outstanding grant reports due to us. You don't owe any money back to us if you've been a grantee in the past. Um, I, you know, currently, um, all of the um, current grantees should know this already. And so if you are a current grantee, that's what that will mean to you. If you've never been a grantee before, then this won't really apply to you. Um, you may only apply to one opportunity this cycle. Cycle two, which we're in now, has the Youth and the Humanities Grant, as well as the Capacity Building Grant. Um, so those are the two opportunities that are available now, and you may only apply to one if you're interested in applying this cycle. Um, you can have been an applicant and a grantee in the past cycle. Um, those grant ap applications are currently being reviewed and we should know um, decisions on those grants um, by April. So you'll know whether you're a grantee or not in that cycle, but you are still eligible to apply and receive funding in cycle two. Um, the other key piece is that because this is a general operating support grant and we receive our funding through the Commission on the Arts and Humanities, if you are an organization that currently has a general operating support grant from CAH, you cannot apply to this grant. If you were to be selected for funding uh, for this opportunity, there are some key requirements. Grantees must submit two reports. We request an interim report, which is due November 15th, 2024. That report is relatively simple and is really just an opportunity for you to check in with us and share where you are um, in, as far as spending. Um, because there's no project requirement, you won't necessarily be able to, to speak to that, but you can at least tell us like this is where we are in the process and this is um, how much money we've spent of the grant. And then final reports are due May 30th. Um, so that's 30 days after the end of the grant period. Um, which is April 30th or so, I guess it's a little more than 30 days. And th that report is a little bit more extensive. You'll be speaking more to how you've measured success, um, what you've achieved with these funds, and you'll also be including all of your receipts and expense documentation. So make sure to be thinking about that throughout the grant period, um, that you're keeping track of statements, of invoices, and um, are keeping those to submit to us at the end of the grant period. 
So allowable and unallowable expenses in this grant, as we said, this is a general operating support grant. So this grant may fund salaries, consulting fees, it can fund your rent and utilities, it can fund information technology, um, admin fees, other general operating expenses related to your organization. What it cannot fund is food, refreshments, hospitality, parties. Um, we are not able to fund tuition and scholarships. Um, we're not able to fund debt reduction, regranting. If you are an organization that gives grants, you would not be able to use these funds for that purpose or funding to foreign or domestic government agencies. There we go. So just to give you a sense of some projects that we funded this past year, these are two Youth and Humanities grantees from 2023. Mikva Challenge, that's an organization based in DC that works with youth to engage them civically, um, to provide them skills so that they can um, engage in issues that are concerning to them in their communities and in their schools um, through civic engagement training and opportunities. And the story of our schools is an organization that received a grant this year. And that organization focuses on building historic exhibits uh, and stories from their schools themselves. They're conducting oral histories with um, staff and alumni from their schools and producing public exhibits in their schools to tell those stories. So I'd like to pause here and ask for you all to um, take a moment to think about questions you may have, but also to please introduce yourselves if that's something you'd like to do. This is an opportunity, you know, this is a workshop and one of the goals behind this project or this, this presentation is to um, allow you to think through some of your projects. So if you'd like, please unmute yourself um, and share who you are and what your organization does. Um, you can also drop it in the chat if you'd wish and also ask any questions that may have come up. Um, if I can, uh, I guess I'll jump in there. <laughs> My name is uh, Dr. Frazier White with a group called Faith for the City. And uh, our, our mission is primarily to empower youth and young adults um, to be um, agents of transformation in our city. Uh, and we primarily have used, try to use creatively the arts and um, academic enrichment, um, uh, a number of things, but for the purpose of empowering community. So uh, that's a little bit about us. And I guess my question was, uh, as I was navigating, seeing uh, what is, what's the, I guess, benchmark um, that kind of helps you all determine if we fit the uh, criteria of an organization that 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 matches the humanities and humanities DC. Um, that's a th thank you first for introducing yourself. Um, that's a good question. I think one of the key benchmarks we'll look for is your mission statement. Um, we will also be asking about your programming, the programming that your organization offers, mm -hmm. and how you make decisions about which programs to offer as well as making sure that you are uh, an organization that serves youth and have a track record of working with youth. Gotcha. Yeah, I hope that helps answer that. And uh, so uh, just lastly then, then where does that, um, so is that something that we probably would navigate upon ap application or is there a way to, in applying, not wait until we get an answer to find out what how we're assessed? Does that make any sense? Yes, definitely. Um, yes, and I understand that going through the whole process of applying and then feeling like you're not eligible by the end is is tricky and we don't wanna make organizations go through that. Um, so you can certainly reach out to us directly. Um, mm -hmm. If you'd like, you can email. Um, we also offer office hours and I'll share that link in a bit, um, but you can sign up for a 20 to 30 minute session with myself or with Hillary, where you can talk through your project and figure out whether or not you're eligible to apply and how to kind of frame your application. Gotcha. Sounds good. I see a few, two things coming through the chat. So I just want to share it with everyone. 
Um, so Beth is with an organization called Archaeology in the Community, and they work with students, teachers, and communities to document and share local heritage. They have in-school and out-of-school programs in D.C. Um, to do hands-on archaeology activities. And then we also have Latrice um, from Best Kids, and they actually have a question. Is arts appreciation part of the humanities disciplines, or is that a secondary discipline? Thank you, both of you. Um, thanks, Beth, and thanks, Latrice. So I do think that arts appreciation can definitely be considered a humanities discipline. Um, the key to think about there would be, is your organization as focused or more focused on the appreciation piece of arts um, and how those arts are applied to the kind of questions that we had asked in the earlier slides about you know, place in society, building empathy, cross communication among communities. Um, is that appreciation of art a tool for that? Or is the purpose and mission of your organization more to just present that art and have it be interpreted for art's sake? If that's the case, then you would be considered more of an arts organization and likely not eligible to apply. Um, you would certainly have an opportunity to make your case, but that would be kind of how I would think about that question. Yeah, there's definitely a fine line between the arts and the humanities, that's for sure. Um, so yeah, I, I also recommend that you set up an office hours appointment with one of us, Latrice, and anyone else on the line who has a more like arts organization, so we can really talk through if there's enough of a humanities component that would make you eligible for this opportunity. Any thoughts or questions before we move forward? I can introduce myself and also um, have a question. So my name is Dr. Bethany Monet, and I'm assistant professor of community writing at University of the District of Columbia. Um, and so I am interested in exploring like partnership opportunities with youth serving community based organizations and um, offering like my background is in like participatory research with youth using the arts as a tool of, of transformational change. And so um, I guess my question was one to the uh, humanities DC organizers like I'm not sure if this is the right grant opportunity for a university based um, humanities practitioner to apply through, or if I would be better suited to like find a youth serving community partner um, to work with. And then relatedly, like I'm also um, starting a DC based chapter of like a participatory youth research project that would um, work with first generation students to uh, move into university humanities based pathways um, and supporting them through high school and into the first years of college using the humanities research practices as a um, college bridge tool as well. So um, I know that's kind of a lot, uh, <laughs> but I guess my question would be um, like, is this the right grant for me to apply for to support something like that? Um, and also for anyone else on the call, like just to let y'all know that I'm here, I'm new in this role and I'm interested in partnering with organizations and offering UDC's resources and research support. That's very cool. Thanks, Bethany. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say probably, you know, applying as um, UDC would likely not be eligible to apply for this opportunity. So if you were kind of working through the UDC foundation or something like that, but, um, you know, if you do find organizations to partner with and to be a team member um, on that grant, um, you know, this is a general operating support grant. And so if you found an organization that wanted to work um, with you, but needed additional funding to make that happen, um, you could encourage them to apply for this grant and those funds could be used for that purpose. Um, but your second point, um, the, the initiative, the research initiative, is that something that are you going to be building a nonprofit or is that just a different, just 
that'll be part of my my work here at the university and i'll be partnering Same. with the um like the first gen student support like dual enrollment program that already exists here and then building out like a research program around that that supports youth so it okay. won't be like its own nonprofit it'll be under the udc nonprofit umbrella okay um i will think about that and whether that could be eligible in the future um for this grant opportunity, that one might actually be more appropriate for one of our program grants, um, which we will offer later um, toward the end of this year again um, in the first cycle. Um, so yeah, I'm, I know that's probably not exactly what you want to hear, that maybe these opportunities aren't the right ones. But I think that if you could find an organization that you wanted to partner with to do this work, that that could, that could be a way to have this grant support your work. Yeah. I'm totally of the opinion like there's so many people already doing amazing things I don't need to like build something new <laughs> if it's redundant so thank you and if others on the call wish to jump out feel free and share with us got another um message in the chat this is from Kari I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing your name wrong um and they work with I saw DC which is a local community-based program that seeks to preserve, uncover, and honor the past of DC's historic Black communities. Um, oh, I, I like this sentence. You say, the currents of the past flow directly into our present. To wade through the waters of our often forgotten history is to stir waves of understanding and heightened awareness. That, that is part of the humanities. So that beautiful sentence. <laughs> Thank you, Kari. I'll move forward, but if others wish to, you know, share out their their work or if things come up, please feel free to to jump in. Um, so the next thing we'll talk about is the weighted criteria of this grant. Um, we look at two kind of key criteria in this grant that our grant reviewers will review. Um, first, I will say that our grant review process is a fully community based process. We um, invite community members um, who work in the humanities, who have DC connections, who are passionate about this work to apply to be reviewers. Um, they submit an intake and um, application online to be reviewers and um, review no more than 15 applications unless maybe there's some that have to review 16, but we try to keep it to a reasonable amount of applications. The review process takes um, a few weeks. Reviewers typically um, spend like 15 hours working on their application reviews. And there's a meeting at the end where reviewers join together to kind of discuss their, their scores and decisions are made. And um, that process is all done externally. We, um, are, we support the process, we support the reviewers, but we on staff do not make funding decisions. Um, we simply support the community-based process. Reviewers receive a $250 honorarium for their volunteer work, um, and that is once they've completed the whole process. So if that's something that would interest you, um, please let us know. We um, do accept new reviewers, and it's, as we said, totally community-based. So this is an opportunity to engage with us as well. And if you are an applicant, you can also be a reviewer if you're interested. Um, you would not be reviewing the same applications um, that you are applying to. So if you want to apply for Youth in the Humanities and you want to be a grant reviewer, you would instead be potentially reviewing the capacity building applications instead. Um, but it's a really exciting process and more information about becoming a grant reviewer is also on our website. So when reviewers are reviewing applications, this is some of the criteria that they'll be thinking about. So they'll first look at the organization profile. Um, this is worth 50% of the total score. And what we're looking for here is that the applicant organization has an explicit mission and track record in the humanities in DC. Also, the applicant's core audience is DC youth and young people ages 11 to 24. 
the applicant should demonstrate an understanding of those youth and engage them in the humanities as a tool to explore issues that they identify as important to themselves and their communities. So, you know, we're looking for you to respond with evidence, with, with past experience, um, with uh, links to programs, things like that, that demonstrate that this is the work that your organization does and that you have a track record in this work. Um, the final piece of this criteria is that the applicant's programming is responsive to the needs and desires of the core audience. They describe how they define and measure success and demonstrate that their programming has been successful. Um, so again, when we say you know, successful, defining success, this is really how you as an organization define success. Um, does this mean you know, that we've expanded our engagement over the years, um, that we've implemented the programs that we set out to implement? You know, that, is, that is success, um, and that is if that's how it's defined by you. Um, we don't um, offer um, you know, criteria for how we define success within a nonprofit organization. And that's one of the reasons why this funding is for general operating, because we want to support organizations operations and allow them to to do that work um, without needing to kind of tie it to specific projects. Um, we feel that the programming itself should be supported um, through this funding as long as you're doing this work and can show that you've done it in the past. And um, in a second, we'll go through the application and I will show you where this, um, this information is requested. There's another piece. The second piece that we um, will be looking for is community outreach, access, and inclusion. So this is worth 50% as well. The applicant clearly defines and demonstrates an understanding of the community they serve. The applicant has programming and services that are inclusive and accessible. This includes, but isn't limited to financial, geographic, demographic, cultural, and physical, physical inclusion and accessibility. When we say accessibility, we mean public access to the work that you are doing. Um, this does not necessarily need to be ADA compliance. We know that ADA um, only applies to certain organizations of a certain size. Um, and so we don't want this to um, exclude you if you feel that you're not quite meeting each one of these areas, but the best that you can do to describe how you're being inclusive, how you're being accessible um, will be, will be uh, super helpful in your application. The applicant's leadership and staff represent its core audience and the community that it serves, or the applicant describes a reasonable plan reasonable plan for doing so, for ensuring that your leadership, that your staff, the people who make up your organization actually reflect the folks that you're trying to serve and represent their needs. And lastly, the applicant describes effective methods to engage and reach your target community. It's wonderful to have the um, expectation and goal of reaching a target community, of reaching youth, but how will you plan to do that? Or how are you doing that? That will be something that you'll want to address in your application responses. Um, so now I want to shift over to the actual application itself. Um, we use an online application system called Foundant. And I'm linking here to um, the instructions. So this link didn't actually go to where I thought it should. So first here, this is our website. This is the Humanities DC website. Um, and I've just gone to grant opportunities, which is under here, um, under community grants. And this is a really good page um, to find a lot of the kind of key information that you will need. Um, you can see linked right up here at the top, our capacity building and our youth and the humanities opportunities. Um, these are all of our grant opportunities. Um, you can see that the due dates from of May 1st are the two grant opportunities that are open now. The other grant opportunities close February 20th. Um, we also link to um, info sessions. So this, this session is being recorded and will eventually be linked down here. Um, we have a general information session that includes ASL interpretation, and you can find that linked here, as well as lots of applicant resources. And what I wanted to share was this link to Foundant Instructions. Foundant, again, is the grant management system that we use to accept and review applications. And um, it's, you know, online systems can be funky. We know this, and we know that um, digital literacy differs across the board, and we wanna make this 
as barrier free a process for you as possible. So these are some um, really key instructions for how to create an account and found it if you haven't done so already. Um, if you are an existing grantee, if you have applied for a grant in the past, you likely already have a found it account. And we strongly, strongly ask that you do not create a new one. Um, if you think you have an account, but you're not sure what your login information is or, or you don't know your password, just reach out to us directly and we can try to help figure that out for you and get you access. Because then you can also see your past applications. You can see um, any information that you entered previously. So just calling out these instructions to, um, to get into Foundant. And again, you can find those here under applicant resources. If you go to the Youth and the Humanities page directly, you can also find those um, here, Foundant instructions, as well as a link to Foundant, which will take you to the application. So I have it up here and um, let's take a look at it um, in detail so that you can kind of see what to expect. At the top, we mentioned the review process. So as I just described earlier, this is the process of um, how we have our community grant reviewers review the applications. We request some key applicant information, namely your award and how you learned about this grant opportunity. This really helps us to ensure that we're reaching the communities that we want to reach and beyond. And then key details, this is just how you will name your project. Because this is a general operating support grant, again, you don't have to have a specific project, but this is just like the name of the grant project that you're submitting to us so that you can find it and that we know um, what, what it's called essentially. Project type, there's only one option. You would enter general operating support. Um, so then back, if we think back to the um, weighted criteria that we just described, this is that first piece, the organizational profile. This is where, and you can find, this is exactly what I just uh, presented. This is what reviewers are looking for. And this is what you'll be thinking about when you're responding to these questions. So the first question here is the humanities discipline. This is the primary discipline that you feel your organization employs or works in, um, or has a mission to employ um, through your work as an organization. You will have an opportunity to describe the multiple disciplines that you work in, and we don't expect that every organization simply has one discipline that there's that they focus on, but we do ask you to identify your primary humanities discipline. And so those are listed here. And then mission and programming. This is where you will describe your mission. Um, you will actually enter your mission statement um, and include information about the community that you reach, your core audience. Um, discussing your current programs and the programs that you plan to initiate, um, any initiatives, this really uh, describes or will help kind of paint a picture of the work that you actually do and how it's tied to your mission. Um, how do you make decisions about programming? How do you decide which programs to implement, which programs to change? Um, entering that information will be key as well. And then how you make decisions, um, or excuse me, how you define success and determine how you are successful. So this is a this is a narrative um, uh, response, and we encourage you to be as detailed as possible in this response and to ensure that you're addressing each of these points, um, making sure that you're um, you're able to respond to each of these things because that's what our reviewers will be looking for. There's also opportunity to attach samples of your work or um, other things that you find will be uh, descriptive or allow you to explain this work um, and you can do so here. There's also an appendix section below, which I'll show you in just a moment, um, where you can enter additional supporting documents. You'll enter your annual budget, your organization's annual budget for the previous fiscal year, the number of full-time employees that work at your organization, and the UEI number. So um, we have a link here to sam.gov that will share all of that. If you have issues with uh, getting a UEI, please reach out to us. Um, we've helped a few organizations go through the process uh, last cycle and can speak to that a little bit. Then you wanted to um, respond uh, about your target audience and the demographics of your target audience. So the age ranges that you reach, the wards that you serve, and these are, you can select multiple wards here. You can also select multiple or, uh, age groups. Um, the race and ethnicity of the target audience that you're reaching. 
Um, and we ask these questions to kind of help us um, understand who we are reaching through our grant making. This uh, information we collect and um, helps us to um, understand who we reach because through our grantees, we're reaching um, the constituents that you all reach. And then it allows us to kind of report back to that and, and, and uh, continue to receive funding from the Commission on the Arts and Humanities. Um, I see a question just popped up. So the DUNS number is the same as the UEI number. Um, it is not the same, but the UEI number replaced the DUNS number. So if your organization has a DUNS number, um, you likely need to go through the process to get a new UEI number. I apologize profusely that that is the case. If I could control it, I would. Um, we know that it's a process and that nonprofits have to jump through a lot of hoops. But as I said, this getting of the UEI number shouldn't be a super complicated process. It just can take um, some time for them to actually issue you one. So you'll want to make sure on the SAM.gov website that you um, are issued a, a current UEI number. And then the last piece of the organizational profile is this financial statement. This is required for all applicants. And we ask that you provide your most recent audited financial statement. If your organization does not conduct an annual audit, you'll want to provide the most recent annual financial statement showing your expenses and, um, and the way that your organization has spent its funds. I just wanna say really quickly um, about the demographic checkoff boxes. Um, it is okay if your organization only works in a single ward or that your target audience is just one demographic group. Like you don't need to expand your organization or your mission um, to serve everyone in DC. Uh, we don't expect that and we don't want you to do mission creep for this. Um, so just be aware, like it is okay if you work in a very, very particular community. Thanks, Hillary. Yeah. Um, and okay, so that's the organizational profile. That's the first fifty percent of the application. The next question is again going back to the weighted criteria: community outreach, access, and inclusion. This is where you're speaking about the uh, accessibility and inclusion of your programming and the community that you reach. Um, so you will make sure in this response to uh, identify and ad rather address each of these. Whoops. I uh, went to the PowerPoint. Hold on a second. Here we go. Okay. Hopefully you can see the application now. Um, so this is where you will um, define the community that you serve. Um, how your programming is inclusive and accessible to the community that you serve, your leadership and staff, and how you reach and engage with your target community. So this is a narrative response and you'll want to ensure that you're very detailed and that you're addressing each of these key points. Then there is the budget section. So we don't actually request that you submit um, line items, that you submit, fill, fill out a table, Again, this is a general operating support and the purpose is to support your general operations. However, it would be helpful if you could please describe how you intend to use the funds. Um, this helps to, to give us information about the, how the funds will be used and how it will support your work as an organization. The appendix section includes opportunities for you to add additional supporting documentation to describe your work as an organization, to describe your past successes and programs, um, the core audience that you're reaching, things like that. Um, and then finally, you will sign your application electronically. Um, we to, to sign the application, you will simply um, type your name in as an electronic signature. The signature should be um, somebody who has the uh, legal ability to sign on behalf of the organization. And um, it will be ensuring all of these uh, compliance and certification issues. So I will pause there quickly and see if there are any questions about um, the application.
Okay, I'm not seeing any questions. So hopefully that means you're getting the information that you need. So let me go back to the presentation and just address a few key things, um, which, and, and if you have additional questions, you can ask. So sorry, let me go back to share my screen. Are they all okay? Okay, so thank you for bearing with me there. So, for components of a successful application, I feel like we've stressed this many, many times, but the humanities focus is clear and well explained. It's very clear that you as an organization are a humanities organization, that you use the humanities and humanities disciplines as a key piece of your mission and um, a central piece to your programming and the work that you do. Um, that you also have uh, provided evidence that you work with young people, primarily aged 11 to 24, and that you have a proven track record of working with and understanding that audience. And then lastly, you provide detailed and very clear responses to each of the questions and address each of those bullet points. We really tried to make it very clear um, and make sure that the questions are reflecting what we say in the weighted review criteria so that it's very clear what kind of information we're requesting of you. And then some common application issues. Um, you know, the flip side of being detailed is that the application doesn't provide uh, enough details. So being extremely detailed, our reviewers, as we said, they're community members. They're not necessarily professional grant reviewers or professional humanities folks. And so I would go into the application process assuming that your reviewers won't know anything about your work and won't know your organization. We ask reviewers to really just look at the application itself and not use um, external sources to kind of de determine how they score certain applications. Um, so you really wanna provide the details that you feel are necessary in the application itself. Um, I think you know this, uh, this presentation is intended to give you um, an overview of this grant opportunity. However, um, I do strongly encourage all of you to read the request for proposal. I noticed that Hillary dropped the link to that in the chat. Um, you can also find that linked on the Grant Opportunities website when you go to Youth in the Humanities. Then again, on that um, right-hand side, you'll see at the very top the link to the request for proposals. Um, it's a little bit of a lengthier document, but it will provide all of the information that you need. Um, and you really don't want to get up to the, to the deadline of the application and realize you missed something very key. So we strongly encourage you to, to read through that request for proposal or RFP. And then the last thing is um, a common issue, and we experienced this last cycle, is that folks wait until the very last minute to hit submit on their founded application, and then there's some kind of issue, internet goes out, you know, um, because this is all done online, we encourage you to, to not wait until the very last moment. Um, if there are you know, sig significant issues with on our end with our system, we will certainly address those at the time. Um, and we encourage you to let us know if you're experiencing issues with Foundant, please, please let us know as soon as possible so that we can address them. Um, but we encourage you to allow for just a little bit of leeway in case there are issues with your submissions. Um, Foundant is an online system that we don't control and sometimes there are weird glitches. And so making sure you have ample time to, to um, uh, you know, have issues and, and, and allow for them is key. And that concludes my presentation. Um, I would love to hear from you if you all have thoughts, if you have additional questions, if you want to um, talk about your organization at all, connect with one another, please feel free to do so. Hi, thank you so much for the presentation. Um, I recently was hired by the Smithsonian's National Portrait Gallery to be their teen program specialist. And so I was wondering if the primary target audience, my primary target audience is 13 to 19. Does that qualify me for this grant or is it something that 
majority of the efforts by the by the institution need to be focused on youth? Um, in this case, it you know, unless there is a separate nonprofit or um, you know, separate organization that your work is encompassed by, we would be looking um, at the primary target audience for the organization as a whole. Um, but it's some if it, it, that could be something we can talk about offline um, to try to figure out a way, or if there's organizations um, similar to Bethany's uh, comments that you partner with that maybe could benefit from this funding that could also support your um, partnerships that could work as well. Because we we don't provide funding to federal agencies oh, or sure. federal adjacent agencies like the Smithsonian, unfortunately. Got it. Thank you for that information. And I, I definitely have people in mind to forward uh, this on to for sure. I just want to show you, um, since I mentioned it, where to find the request for proposal. Um, again, if you go to grant opportunities on our website, find the youth and the humanities opportunity, and then that request for proposal is linked on that first first uh, link there. Um, and this goes into uh, more detail certainly than I did today, um, and I think it's a it's a good document to make sure you're familiar with as you're applying. And I see Hillary dropped information about becoming a grant reviewer. So definitely check that out as well. Um, that is linked here under community grants and become a grant reviewer. There's a very brief intake form that we use. Beth, I feel like those thumbs up are for us and I appreciate it. <laughs> yes. Well, thank you all so much. I don't want to keep us, um, you know, if there are no additional questions. But that said, um, we are available to answer your questions and we have office hours, um, which are also linked under those applicant resources. You can find that. You can sign up for a 30 minute slot with one of us and we can talk in more detail about your organization and kind of go over those things um, in advance. Uh, I see a question, um, Quintina, if a nonprofit was recently started based on a successful project that was previously using a co-sponsor, will it still meet requirements? I mean, yes, it, it should, as long as the nonprofit is um, registered in DC, has a DC address, and has its own valid EIN number, then yes, um, that, that should be fine. Well, thank, thank you again so, so, so much. Oh, go ahead. Um, yeah, really quickly, uh, because we had someone join very recently, uh, just to reiterate, this training has been recorded and it will be put on our website very soon for your reference. Uh, yes, and, and um, I want to just call out Bethany's note here that she pasted her email and, and said, if any community organizations are interested in partnering with UDC around youth-driven humanities research, especially to support college access and inclusion, please reach out and she includes her email. So thank you, Bethany. Okay, well, thank you all so much for your time today. Um, we really look forward to reviewing your applications and uh, thank you so much for being interested in this opportunity and for joining us today. I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day. Take care. <laughs>